So, good afternoon. I hope you have enjoyed your lunch. Now, we are going to continue with the talks. First one is with Oliver Grissel, and he will be talking about tricks for multi efficient multi-core computing. Please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, my name is Olivier. I'm, I'm a software engineer at Inria, and I work, uh, among other things, on, on scikit-learn. But today, I'm going to talk about how to use single machine, uh, multiple CPUs on a single machine to do compute-intensive operation, compute-intensive workloads. Is the volume good enough in the, in the back? Yeah. All right. Um, and this work uh, is joint work with Thomas Moreau, uh, from uh, CMLA and uh, ENS. So the slides are online. If if the uh, if this is a bit too small on the on the screen, you can check it out offline online. So today I'm gonna talk about uh, the concurrent futures API from the standard library, and then uh, the, this API is quite flexible and it allows you to do thread-based or process-based multi-core computing. And we'll discuss the, the pro and cons of the two options. And some limitation and some extensions that uh, we, we provide in a third party library. And finally, I would like also to uh, discuss a bit of uh, thread-based parallelism for array operations using uh, BLAST via NumPy, for instance. And how to better understand the, the performance profile of uh, those operations. So let's start with the uh, embarrassingly parallel computation. So uh, in the standard library, uh, there are two options. Uh, the, the oldest one is the multiprocessing pool class, uh, which is the first implementation of a, of a pool of worker where you can dispatch uh, function calls to be executed in parallel on, the, on different cores. And uh, more recently in Python 3, there is a new API, which is called Concurrent Features, which is also part of the standard library. On Python 2, there is an extension package, if you want. And it's, it's reusing the, under the hood the building blocks of multiprocessing, but it's, pro, it's providing a new uh, front end that is also more, more stable, and the, the, the API is more flexible and nicer. And finally, we'll talk a bit about how to make it even better with a, using a third-party project, which we call uh, Loki. So uh, concurrent futures. So in concurrent futures, we have this notion of future. A future is an object that is a reference to a, a result uh, for some asynchronous computation that has been dispatched on, on a worker running on a separate core outside of the main uh, thread uh, of the main program. Uh, the future itself can be in four states, not started, running, canceled, or done, and you can it's a Python object that you can uh, introspect without blocking uh, using the attributes running, canceled, and down. And you can also call a blocking method on that object to fetch the result and to wait for the result. And if the function call has triggered an exception uh, and you call result, you will get the exception directly. But you can also uh, inspect whether or not there is an, an exception and, and uh, fetch it this way. Uh, so let's see an example. So assume that you want to do heavy computation, like for instance, fitting a machine learning model with some hyperparameters on, on some data set. So we have this function fit model uh, that is just returning a model, but I assume that it's, it's taking uh, at least several minutes or maybe several hours to, to, to complete. Uh, what the, the concurrent feature provides you with is a, a, an executor class. So for instance, the thread pool executor class, but you could also import the process pool executor class. Uh, and when you, you use it as a, a context manager with the with uh, block, uh, as soon as you enter that block, it will create the workers. So it could be threads or it could be process. And when you're under that uh, context using the ex executor object, you can submit function calls. So the function fit model has been defined in the main program, but you can submit uh, the execution. So it ships the definition of the function and the argument into some worker. And what you get back as a result uh, in the main program is a future object that you can use to asynchronously uh, control what's happening on the worker. And you can go on and submit additional tasks, for instance, another function call on another, another worker with different parameters. And in the meantime, you can do other stuff uh, in the main program, like monitoring what's happening, uh, updating the user interface, or something like this. And, and 
the execution is happening under the hood uh, on those backends, and they could be done or not, uh, and you can fetch the results afterwards. So to fetch the results, you just call result uh, on the future object, and it will transfer back the, the result of the computation at this point to the main program. And we can do that for the other one as well, which is already done, so we don't, we don't have to wait. And as soon as we exit from this uh, context manager with block, it destroys all the workers. So it, it, it re reads all the system resources that were necessary to do the, uh, the parallel computation. And you're, you're left with the results of the computation that you fetched uh, previously. So we can select uh, two kinds of, uh, of worker process. Uh, one is thread-based and the other one is process-based. So a thread worker is uh, a real system thread. So under Unix, it's a pthread on Windows, it's a Windows thread. And, but all the threads uh, are, are sharing the same Python interpreter. There is only the main Python interpreter running the main program that is being reused for the, work, the other workers. So this has many advantages, such as uh, it's very fast to start and stop a thread. Uh, there, there is a little memory overhead, but it's very low uh, just for the thread state itself. Uh, but there is no copy of the object that you, that you pass to, the, to the, the functions. And more importantly, that makes it possible to have no communication overhead between the, the main process and the workers. Um, but then uh, we are using a Python object to do that, a shared Python object. And because we are sharing the py Python object, we need to make sure that the, the interpreter state and, uh, and the object states are not corrupted by concurrent execution. And to do that, the, the C Python implementation is using a global interpreter lock, uh, which, has some, uh, which introduces some, some challenges. Uh, in particular, this global uh, interpreter lock um, uh, is locking every time, is acquired every time you access uh, an attribute or you call into a function of a Python object, a method of a Python object or you mutate the state of a, a Python object. Um, so it's, it was not initially designed for efficient multi-core computing, but more for simplicity to make sure that the interpreter is safe when you run on separate thread. However, it can be released, this lock, when you're doing long-running I.O. operations. So this is why it's very efficient to use uh, a thread pool to talk to a database or to connect to multiple websites because you can do other stuff in Python while uh, waiting for the, the results of, uh, of a download, for instance. And it can also be released explicitly by some uh, compiled extensions uh, in third-party libraries, for instance, uh, NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-learn, uh, pretty much any uh, library that is written using Cyton and that makes uh, it explicit to release the GIL. Uh, then it's possible to have Python code that runs in parallel of NumPy in a different thread, for instance. On, on different cores. So uh, here is the, a time diagram uh, that is inspired from David Beasley's talks on the GIL. Uh, so you can see different uh, Python threads running in parallel. And you, you see the arrows. This is pure Python code running. And you can see that at any point in time, only the GIL is acquired by one specific thread. And so only that thread can run the Python code, and the others have to wait which means that if you do that to run pure Python code, uh, it's not quicker than sequential uh, execution using one thread to run everything, uh, even if you're on a multi-core machine. However, if you do I.O. intensive stuff, like uh, talking to a database, uh, whenever you're talking to the database, you, you release the guild so you can call in another thread uh, some Python function. Or if you are calling into some native library that is releasing the guild, for instance, if you do a large matrix matrix multiplication in NumPy, the guild is released during that time, so you can do other stuff in, in the meantime. The other way to do uh, parallel pr uh, processing is to use a, a process worker instead of a thread. Uh, in that case, you create a new Python interpreter uh, for, the, for this specific worker. And so that the, the, the workers uh, are no longer independent, uh, are completely independent of one another. So this has in some inconvenience because starting a new Python process can take some more time, even just the process itself, the system process, but also the interpreter. And there is a higher memory overhead because the interpreter itself in memory takes some, uh, some space. 
And there is also a higher communication overhead because you have to uh, pickle and unpickle the arguments of the function calls uh, and transfer them using uh, system pipes or sockets or systems, local sockets, Unix sockets and so on. Um, but then you don't have the guild contention issue anymore because the workers are completely independent of one another. Uh, and so you can, uh, if your code is embarrassingly parallel, uh, then you can really benef benefit from uh, all the cores on, on your machine. Uh, however, you have to know that there are two ways to start a new interpreter for a worker. You can, on, on POSIX at least, uh, uh, POSIX is Unix or Mac OS. Um, and it, it could be just fork or a spawn, a spawn with a fork plus an exec. Uh, and if you just use fork, uh, it's an advantage and it is the default behavior of uh, multiprocessing uh, because uh, it's a low spanning overhead, it's quite quick to do that. Uh, and the interpreter is already warm imported because it already have a copy of all the imported modules that were previously imported in, in the main program. Uh, but then there is some inconvenience because uh, it's, it's not a very correct way to, to do that, to do this uh, from a Unix point of view. And so that can trigger crash in third-party multi-threaded programs. For instance, if you have XGBoost, which is based on uh, OpenMP or Spacey or OpenCV, if you use it in the main program and you call a function in parallel using multiprocessing in a, in a sub-program, uh, then the, the, thread, the internal thread pool of XGBoost or OpenMP uh, will be inconsistent in, the, in, a, in a worker and we are, we basically it will crash, it will freeze. And so this is really hard to debug and very confusing for the users. Uh, so this is why I would not recommend to use the fork way to, uh, to start the, uh, the, the workers. So the alternative is to use spawn, but then the inconvenience, it's, it's safe, but the inconvenience is that it's slower to start, typically a couple hundred milliseconds if you launch uh, many workers. Uh, and you need to, to re-import the libraries in the workers because those are completely new interpreters. Uh, so uh, as a summary, uh, if you use threads, uh, you, you, if you really want to do pure Python code in parallel, let the, can you do that uh, with threads? But if you call into NumPy uh, or Pandas or something that released the gear, uh, that's not, not necessarily an issue. And then you benefit from the fact that you don't have any communication overhead, it's POSIX safe, and there is a low spanning overhead. Uh, however, if you really want to do a pure Python code in parallel, then you're forced to use a process. And then with the fork, you have this uh, uh, POSIX safety issue. Uh, you, can, uh, you can trigger the crash. Uh, and you have the communication overhead of uh, having two processes talking to one another. And the, alter the safest alternative would be to use uh, a spawn. But then you have the issue of uh, low spanning overhead. So starting the new process takes more time. So this is why we uh, introduced Loki as a library. Uh, which makes it possible to hide this issue by keeping a worker of a pool of worker running in the background uh, so that you can reuse this uh, um, and hide this uh, starting uh, overhead. Uh, so basically we, we want to reuse the process pool executor and to keep it uh, uh, as a global singleton of your Python program. Um, the problem is that you need to make sure that it will never deadlock. And some, uh, the default implementation, especially in oldest version of Python, of uh, process pool executor, is actually uh, a reason to cry. Uh, wh when you submit uh, something that is not picklable, then you deadlock your program. You have to control C. You cannot catch this exception. It's just written on STDR. But uh, your program is, is uh, broken, basically. You have to control C and to restart or whatever. And, and uh, the instance of a uh, process pool executor is unusable at this point. It can be completely covered, corrupted. Um, so in, in the Loki project, uh, we, we derive from those uh, base class, but uh, we, make, we added some more tests for very weird situations where worker kill one another or you send unpickable stuff uh, in the results of the, of the uh, of the execution to try and trigger all these possible uh, weird scenarios and to detect them and to fix them. And we plan to contribute the fixes to upstream Python, but it won't be available before 3.7 or 3.8. So in the meantime, you can use uh, Loki. Uh, so, and furthermore, with Loki, you can reuse the executor. Uh, you can reuse a singleton, a global singleton. So we have this uh, get reusable executor, 
And when you create it, you can see, you can introspect, there is a, a, an ident incrementally, incremental identifier on that. You can submit code uh, and get some result as with a regular executor. Uh, if you, later in your code, you, you uh, try to fetch the executor again, it will f return exactly the same instance. So it's very cheap, very quick. Uh, and then if you uh, submit unsafe stuff, like for instance, an argument that is not pickable, then you get a, uh, an executor that you can catch. Uh, it's not a de deadlock anymore. And if you try later to refetch the executor, it will build a new executor that is in a working state. Uh, so it's very easy to, uh, to work in a, a safe manner and a quick manner with this. So finally, um, the last section of my talk would be to talk a bit more about uh, thread bus parallelism for uh, NumPy related stuff like uh, array uh, processing, vector matrices, and so on. So, uh, what is BLAST? BLAST is basically the, uh, the engine behind NumPy, and many uh, array operations implemented in NumPy are actually just wrapper around uh, linear algebra routines that are implemented using a standard API called BLAST. And there are two very efficient implementations that are very popular. Uh, one is open source and it's called OpenBLAST. And it's used by default uh, by, uh, by NumPy when you download it, when you download the binary wheels from uh, PyPI, at least under Linux. Or if you use the, the Conda uh, binary packages from Conda Forge uh, on any platform, it's using OpenBLAST. And if you use the Anaconda distribution, it's using another implementation of BLAST, which is even more uh, efficient but uh, on Intel CPUs, but it's proprietary, uh, which is called Intel MKL. Um, so for instance, if you do a dot of two uh, square matrices or do rectangular arrays, A and B, uh, you will see by default if you use uh, top or edge top or something like this, that all the CPU cores of your machine will uh, go green. 100% uh, usage uh, in many cases. And this is because under the hood, those libraries, they do the thread-based parallelism by themselves. It's not even NumPy that does it. It's really the, the BLAST implementation. And so you can control uh, how many threads are going to be used. It's a bit small, sorry. Uh, by setting up environment variable based on, your, on the implementation of uh, the BLAST that you are using. So you have to know about which one is, is, is being used under the hood. And if you set open BLAST num thread equals two, and then you run your Python code, uh, you can uh, restrict uh, the, uh, the NumPy operation to a specific number of threads and leave some CPUs for other stuff. And for MKL, you just have a uh, different variable, which is called MKL num thread. It's exactly the same behavior. So it's interesting to know about this, and it's even more interesting to, to, to know about how, what are the, the performance behavior of, uh, of uh, using threads or even process on, on, uh, on uh, multi-core machines. And one way to analyze this behavior is to, per, is to do what we call a roof line al analysis. Uh, so what can make your process, uh, 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 what can limit the performance of your process uh, is the hardware. It could be either the, the compute capabilities of your CPU, uh, so you have a maximum CPU speed uh, that really depends on the CPU themselves. So for instance, uh, 100 uh, gigaflops per second on a multi-core machine, a modern day multi-core machine could be even higher than that. Um, so a flop is a floating point operation, like uh, adding two elements in an array or multiplying two elements in an array and so on. But also accessing uh, data from the, the RAM to, to do computation on it is limited. And you typically have a, uh, a bandwidth limit of, uh, let's say, uh, 50 uh, gigabytes per second on, on a big machine. Um, and to know whether this is the RAM that limits or the CPU, uh, uh, can be tricky, and one way to, to know is to compute the arithmetic intensity of your workloads, which is the ratio between uh, floating point operation that you want to do, compute, uh, divided by the number of bytes that you need to transfer over the RAM to do uh, the actual computation. So if we take the example of matrix, matrix multiplication with two matrices of uh, dimension NK and KM, uh, the, the number of flop, uh, floating point operation that you need to do is uh, is a cubic, uh, quadrat, uh, cubic quantity, so the multiplication of all the dimensions. There are three dimensions. And for, for the, the data transfer, 
is actually the size of the two input matrices plus the size of the imp, uh, output matrix. And so this is a quadratic uh, quantity with respect to the dimensions. So depending on the dimensions, we can have a, a linear uh, ar arithmetic in intensity. And uh, there is a particular case where n is equal to 1, for instance, uh, then you have a, the ratio of two uh, uh, quadratic quantity, which is a constant. In that case, it's uh, one quarter or something. So it's always fixed and very low. So let's have a look at a plot, a benchmark of uh, the arithmetic intensity versus uh, on the x-axis versus the, the performance, the, sp the speed of computation uh, in gigaflops per second on the y-axis. And this is a bunch of matrix-matrix multiplications for different dimensions using uh, NumPy and MKL. And uh, you see the blue dots, uh, they are uh, using uh, MKL num thread equal one, so I limit the number of threads available. And the uh, orange dots are with two threads, this is on, on this laptop, so there are only two physical cores. So. And the, uh, the axes are in logarithmic uh, scale, and so you can see that the, the maximum orange performance is around 40 gigaflops, whereas the maximum blue performance is around 20, 21 gigaflops. So it's approximately a, a scale up by a factor of two, which is what is expected. We are really benefiting for, from the course if we have a large ar arithmetic intensity. But if we have a low arithmetic intensity, for instance, if we do a vector uh, matrix multiplication, then we are on the left-hand side of that plot. You can see that then we are limited by those slopes. Those, this is the, the memory bandwidth, the communication to the memory that is limiting the computation. And we cannot really benefit from, from the high-end uh, CPU that we have, because just talking to the memory is limiting the computation. And so I don't know exactly the, the, the theoretical limits from that machine, but you can see that it's around, uh, on my Mac, it's around uh, 25 gigabytes per second. So if your compute is very uh, simple, you can compute the arithmetic intensity of your program. Uh, and then you can, based on this kind of benchmark, you, you can see whether or not uh, you, you're limited by the memory or by, uh, or by the CPU. And I did the same using OpenBLAST. And you can see that the peak performance is approximately the same as MKL. Uh, however, OpenBLAST compared to MKL for lower arithmetic int intensive uh, workload is less efficient. So this is MKL, this is OpenBLAST. So when people say that uh, MKL is 10 times faster uh, than OpenBLAST, it's completely wrong if you are on, on the right-hand side, but it could be significant, OpenBLAST can be significantly slower if you, if you're working with small matrices and you're doing matrix matrix operations. But in, in general, it's quite competitive. And I also ran the, uh, the same on a larger machine with, uh, so, Blue is one core, uh, orange is five cores, five physical cores, and green is 10 physical thread, uh, uh, 10 thread on 10 physical cores. And you can see that the scale up on the right hand side is perfect. We go to from 10 to 50 to 100 gigaflop per second. But on the right hand side, on the left hand side, you, the, the memory bandwidth is limited. And if I compute the speed up of five over one and 10 over one, so this is the speed up on, on the, um, Y axis this time, you can see that for low arithmetic intensive workloads, uh, the speed up, the maximum speed up that we observe is four instead of 10 or instead of five. Whereas if you go on the right hand side, it can go close to 10 or close to five. But uh, so it means that the, the scalability of your code is uh, for low arithmetic intensive stuff is really limited by the, the memory bandwidth first. And you really cannot benefit from a multi-core in that case. So depending on what you do, sometimes you cannot even use your, uh, your CPU even with a ver very uh, optimized uh, implementation. So you have to be very aware of that. So multi-core scalability can be limited by I.O. Uh, with the RAM uh, for low arithmetic intensive stuff. So a bit of conclusion now. Uh, so the, the thread-based uh, mechanism to do multi-core computation can be very efficient if, you're, if the critical sections of your, the performance critical sections of your code are in compiled extensions that release the GIL. And usually that, that's, this method has the lowest overhead and you should definitely uh, start with this and benchmark what kind of speed up you get. Uh, if you don't get a good speed up, 
Uh, then you can decide to try, you can try uh, process-based mechanisms, but I would start with thread first. And if you are using a real operation, make sure that just the, the built-in mechanism from NumPy using BLAST is not already uh, the best way to do it. Most often, it's, it's going to be the best way to, to do it, and there is no point in trying to doing parallelism on top of that. Uh, furthermore, if you want to do process-based parallelism, then you should definitely uh, check out Loki. Uh, to make sure that you have a, a safe way to do it and you won't crash XGBoost or Spacey or OpenMP code, uh, or at least be aware that this problem exists. And finally, uh, Loki is going to be integrated in Joblib, uh, which is another API, uh, a simpler API to do embarrassingly parallel uh, computation. Uh, and it's at some point be going to be part of a scikit-learn uh, to be uh, for uh, training uh, models in parallel uh, in a safe way. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, oh. yeah. thank you for the very great uh, presentation. We have a couple of minutes for the questions. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, this was a great presentation. Um, I, I want to ask about uh, Loki's uh, uh, executor uh, manager. So uh, you said that uh, the processes are staying uh, alive. Mm -hmm. uh, um, my question is like, um, uh, can you and uh, when are you deciding to actually drop the, the, the worker processes? Because at some point you have to do this, right? Yeah, I actually uh, uh, made a simplification. We keep them alive for like 10 seconds or 30 seconds by default. And then they will automatically stop by themselves if they have nothing to do. So that if you call parallel sequential, parallel sequential very quickly, you don't pay for the, the spawning of a head. But if you just do parallel and then sequential for a long time and then parallel again, uh, then you restart, but it's not a problem because uh, you don't do it very often. And does the user have a, a more control on like uh, killing the, the threads? Yeah, I see. Yeah, you have keyword arguments if you want to, uh, to set the worker timeouts. But usually there is no point in tweaking this, like keeping the default should be fine. Hi, thanks for your nice talk. Um, do you have any experience with MKL on AMD processors? And if so, can you comment on uh, speed? I and haven't run the benchmark, uh, but I know that OpenBlast has many specialized kernel for, for AMD, and the OpenBlast de developers, they, they, they follow the newest generation of the chips, uh, even though the, maybe the very latest are not yet implemented, but uh, usually it's quite good. Uh, MKL, I don't know. It's probably reasonable, but uh, uh, Intel has no incentive to, to make AMD chip work faster. Any other question? Yeah. Thank you so much.